Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sharon Smith, and today I'm going to discuss with you my final year project. For my final year project, I've been investigating neurotic zooplankton off the southwest of Britain with a particular focus on any temperature differences on the northern and southern coasts. My hypothesis for this was that there would be no significant difference in the abundance and diversity of zooplankton at each coast. This investigation came about due to my previous interest in a work that is carried out by the Sir Alistair Harvey Foundation of Ocean Science that's based in Plymouth um, and they're also known as SAFOS. Um, part of their research is to monitor plankton abundance using a continuous plankton recorder around the UK. Um, for those of you who don't know, the word plankton originally derives from the Greek word plantos. Plantos means to drift or wander. In the case of plankton, this is accurate. Um, plankton are unable to swim against the current, and this means that they are at the mercy of any physical processes that occur within the ocean. Typically, we imagine plankton to be microscopic organisms that are unable to be seen with the naked eye. However, zooplankton can vastly range in size, they range from below 20 micrometers, these are known as nanozooplankton, up to megazooplankton. Species falling into the category of megazooplankton are typically larger than 20 millimeters. Jellyfish are classed as zooplankton as they are unable to swim against the current. The largest of all these jellyfish is called Cyanae capillata. This is commonly known as the lion's bone jellyfish, which you can see on the screen. Um, as you can see, these are significantly larger than 20 millimetres. Um, they can have a belly of up to 7 foot and the tentacles of up to 120 foot long. A number of zooplankton only remain planktonic for part of their life cycle. These include a variety of benthic invertebrates and fish larvae. These are known as meroplankton. However, species that remain planktonic throughout their entire life cycle are known as holoplankton. Plankton is at the very base of the food chain and phytoplankton is said to account for approximately 95% of the primary production that takes place within the ocean and around 50% of all the primary production on Earth. The ma major primary producers include diatoms, cyanobacteria and dinoflagellates. These primary producers are grazed upon <coughs> by herbivorous zooplankton. In turn, this zooplankton gets consumed by larger species for nutrition, either as a direct food source or from other fish that are preyed upon. Plankton are also a direct food source from the large sharks in the sea, Ceterinus maximus, which we have locally around Cornwall and is commonly known as the basking shark. They are also a direct food source for baleen whales and surface feeding birds such as fulmers and kittiwakes. Typically, neuritic zooplankton inhabit waters that lie over continental shelves. The low density surface water within the neuritic zone help plankton to remain afloat near the water surface and within the photic zone. Plankton are good indicators of climate change within the marine environment because zooplankton, like phytoplankton, are sensitive to their environment and any changes within zooplankton concentration levels can indicate a subtle environmental change. Long-term changes within plankton communities can be attributed to climate change as very few species of plankton are exploited. Any effects upon, upon plankton communities could have a dramatic socio-economic impact on commercial fisheries. As well as any socio-economic impacts, plankton play a key role in the oceanic carbon cycle by removing a large percentage, which is typically up to 50% of the atmospheric carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Due to this, changes in plankton abundance levels could mean that higher levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide would be present. Plankton are ectophagic species, which means that the temperature within the environment they inhabit influences their metabolism. The temperature of the water is also a key factor that influences plankton larval productivity. Typically, within temperate waters, which we have around the UK, a peak characterises the annual cycle of zooplankton in late spring, which extends into the summer. A secondary peak then follows this in autumn. The samples that I used for my investigation were collected during the secondary peak in the autumn of 
autumn of last year. The samples were collected using a traditional net that was towed using a sea kayak. For each sample, the temperature and salinity data was also recorded. Once the samples had been collected, they were preserved using formalin and also treated with glycerol to prevent the deformation of preserved organisms. This method of preservation is discussed in a book by Goswami that is called Zooplankton Methodology, Collection and Identification of Field Manual. Once the samples have been preserved, they are processed in the lab to establish the abundance and diversity of each sample. To count the abundance, 50 20 ml subsamples that were stained with iodine were counted for abundance from each 1 litre sample that had been collected. They were counted using a standard 20 ml Bogorov tray under a stereo microscope. This method of abundance counts is common and has been documented in other scientific papers. The diversity of species is established by processing a 1 ml sample that has been taken from the previous 20 ml sample using a separate graft slide. This sample is also stone dividing. 20 squares within the Cedric Rafter slide are chosen at random, and any species within the selected square are identified and recorded. The reason for the random sampling is to prevent biased results. Once all the samples have been processed in the laboratory, they need to be statistically analysed. A number of statistical tests were used to analyse my data, um, including the Man Whitney test, which is this equation just here. Um, Simpson's Biodiversity Index and also the Berg Parker Dominance Index. The Man Whitney test, which is established using this equation, is used to analyse the data collected for abundance. This test is used as the data is non parametric and unpaired. The Simpson's Biodiversity Index is used to establish if there is any difference in the species on each case and is regularly used within similar investigations. As well as the Simpson's Biodiversity Index, I use the Burton Parker Dominance Index to establish dominant species within the sample. This statistical test has been previously used in similar projects, such as the paper by Bugrand called The Biodiversity of North Atlantic and North Sea Calanoid <coughs> Pods. This test is, is good to use in conjunction with the Simpson's Biodiversity Index, as they typically support one another. Okay, on this graph you can see the temperature differences at each site. Although there is some variation of the temperature on a sample basis, overall there's no significant difference statistically with the samples. There are a number of factors that need to be taken into account when looking at this data. To begin with, the thermometer used to collect the temperature data is an entry level device that may have issues with calibration. Also, the temperature was taken once when the sample was collected. A better method for this would have been to record the temperature continuously throughout the sample and um, this would increase the number of recordings per sample which I could gain an average for which would make a more accurate result. This bar chart shows the diversity of species at each site. Each species which has appeared within the sample was recorded and as previously mentioned, the results were analysed using Simpson's Biodiversity Index and the Berg Parker Dominance Index. The Simpson's Biodiversity Index showed that overall, Falmouth had a greater diversity of species. The findings from the Berg Parker Dominance Index support these findings. Falmouth has a high diversity of species with a low dominance, whereas Niki has a lower diversity but a higher dominance. As you can see from this bar chart, the most abundant species are Arcartia and Balanus. Members of the Balanus species are part of phylum Crustacea and are commonly known as barnacles. Barnacles are also a good example of meroplankton. These species are widely distributed within the samples at both sites, which is typical for plankton studies within the UK. A species that dominated just the Falmouth site was a member of the arthropod family called Avadne. Avadne, more commonly known as water fleas, are typically abundant in UK waters between March and October and feed on dinoflagellates and tintinids. This species is parthenogenic, meaning it can reproduce asexually and this can lend to fast population blooms under the right conditions. The reason that this species may only be present in Falmouth 
could be related to the localised freshwater inputs and other anthropogenic factors such as, such as sewage outlets located close by. As said before, the most abundant species present at both sites was Arcartia. Arcartia is a genus of copepod in the order of Cannanoida. The reason for Arcartia being the most abundant species present could be because individuals within the Cannanoida order are said to outnumber all other animal taxa within marine zooplankton and may also account for up to 70% of the total zooplankton biomass. The abundance of species recorded for each sample is shown on this line graph. As you can see, the first recorded sample data found with appears to be significantly higher than Nuki. The total number of plankton counted for the first FAM of sample was 266,732, whereas Nuki was less than half of this at 124,026. Although the line graph seems to show a difference between the abundance on each coast, when statistically analysed using Malmutney tests, it was calculated that there was no significant difference between the abundance at each site. The p-value calculated for the abundance count using the Man Whitney was 0.0947. And although we can conclude from the graphs that Falmouth had a greater abundance, it was not statistically different. Okay, looking at this summary of results, it can be concluded that there is no significant difference in the abundance of species at each coast, meaning that we fail to reject the null hypotheses. A t-test was also conducted to statistically analyse the temperature variance and it can also be concluded that there is no significant difference in the temperature at each site. The Simpsons Biodiversity Index and Burger Parker Dominance Index show a biodiversity at Falmouth but a higher dominance level at Nuki. In conclusion, although climate change and temperature are key factors which can have an effect on plankton, this investigation has been unable to establish a trend in abundance and diversity related to temperature difference. Further data collected over a longer time period may however show different results. Therefore, I would suggest that if this investigation was to be continued, it would be conducted all year round and over a significant number of years, so a more accurate picture of temperature change could be monitored. However, the data collected during this investigation has shown some interesting results, which upon further analysis could be quite significant. The data may also be valuable for future research projects as a detailed list of species, along with the abundance of species, has been recorded. Any future investigations can compare results and establish whether there are any changes within species diversity at each location, which could prove beneficial. Just before I change the slide, the upper polar down at the bottom is species of Avatni. Um, you can tell this by the single eye that's present on that, if it's slightly turned around. Um, finally, again, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to me discuss my second year project on neuritic zooplankton off the southwest of Britain. I really enjoyed undertaking this project and it's been a pleasure to share my findings with you. Um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask me now or come and speak to me at the store for more detailed discussions. Thank you.